Okay, guys, so in documenting um, everything that goes into the preparation of this RV, getting it ready uh, to live in it full time, and then eventually living in it full time and traveling full time and doing these videos from the road, one thing I wanted to document was things that I have learned along the way. I have watched a lot of videos where people give like the top 10 this, top 10 that, 10 things you should know about, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of it is aimed straight at RV newbies. I mean, the title, and maybe my title will be like this, will literally say something like, 10 things you should know for RV newbies or something like that. Well, I watched a whole bunch of those. I mean, I've wanted to do this for like eight years. So I've watched a lot of that stuff. But what I find is that most of it is not documented like from the get go along the way. Most of it is people who have been doing it for a few years, two, three, five, ten 10 years. And then they start doing these videos and they're thinking back to when they started it and they're giving you, you know, 10 things from when I started RVing. So I thought that it would be helpful if I would create these videos now as I am learning things. I've only owned my RV for about three months now. So everything that I am learning is fresh in my mind. And I just really think that I can give people who are considering doing this or who have just started out, I really think that I can give a good view of, uh, of things that, that are happening in this time period, in the very beginning here. And I'm gonna continue this throughout my whole journey because I'm sure that this is an endless learning process no matter how long you've been doing it. I was gonna go out to the RV and do this tonight, but it's like 20 degrees out there. There's snow and ice and everything else. And I thought, you know what, I'd have to get out there and warm it up for an hour before I could even start talking so I wouldn't have to have the generator and the motor running and everything. So forget it, we're just gonna do it right here in my home office. <laughs> That's one of the benefits I have since I'm not out there full time yet. But while I was sitting here working on some other things, like I've got stacks of DVDs over here and I'm basically taking them out of their boxes and putting them in these sleeves and putting them in a book. It's just an easier way to store these DVDs on the road in an RV. Uh, you put your slip covers in there and then in the back you put your discs. And uh, yeah, I don't even know how many this thing holds, but it holds a lot. So anyway, let's get down to business here. What I'm gonna to talk to you about today is the first 10 things I learned when I bought my RV. Now this is not specifically about my RV. There are some things about my specific RV, but it's just the first 10 things that I learned in the process of buying and dealing with my RV. The first one I have is a question I had that really scared me, and I reached out to a friend of mine who also drives a Class A. His name is Mike at Random Bits RV here on YouTube if you want to check out his channel. And my question was, can you just get in this RV, sit down in the driver's seat, and drive away like a normal car? Or are there like, you know, all kinds of different knobs and switches and, and anything else I need to know about that I need to prepare before I can drive? Different things I need to know about before I can drive away. Now, I'm not talking about like having your slides in, having your jacks up, anything like that. I'm talking about when it's ready to roll, can I just get in it and drive away like it's a car? And the answer is yes. At least with mine, I have a 2003 Winnebago Itasca Sunrise. It is a gas coach. And all I have to do is get in, turn the key, push the gas and drive away. Now, of course, it's not as easy to drive as a car, but the functionality is the same. It has a gas pedal, a brake pedal. You put the key in, turn it, and you go. Now, I might throw a few little extra things in here too. Probably the second thing I really learned was that you shouldn't go down roads that have low hanging tree branches. If you watch my video of the first ride when I picked up my RV, you can literally hear me hitting tree branches because they were so low. Now, I know it's not always easy to avoid those roads. I mean, once you get on them, what are you gonna do? Just turn around in the middle of the road? But I definitely learned to watch for those low hanging branches. So even though that's technically number two, we're gonna call this next one number two. And that is that I had to learn where my, uh, my center balance was when I'm driving down the road. And what I mean is like when you're driving a car or a truck, you're pretty low to the ground. So you can just look straight ahead and you're going to be balanced in your lane. But in an RV, you are sitting up so high that you feel like you're looking down out of a helicopter or something. At least in mine, it's a big class A, like I said, and it is as wide as your lane. So when I was first driving it, I'm looking in every mirror. I'm looking out the windows. I'm looking down out the front window. And it was very, very uncomfortable 
to find that right space in the road where I was actually between uh, the lines of my lane. You certainly don't want to go left of center, and you certainly don't want to go right, because a lot of times I found that there's ditches on the sides, and you just, you don't want to go off the road. So I had to learn where that anchor field was, I guess you should say. And what I learned was is that it's about four car lengths ahead of me, and if I'm watching right up there, I am anchored in my lane where it keeps me right between my lines. And I can look over at my mirrors on both sides and make sure, but as long as I'm looking in that one field there, then I stay right between those lines. So you do find that comfort zone, but in the beginning it's kind of scary. Number three, is the titling and registration process. I was scared of it. I thought it was going to be some big deal, and it turns out it was just as easy, if not easier, than taking care of a regular car registration. I mean, I literally went in, I changed the title over, um, I got my registration, I paid my taxes and fees and that, and walked out the door. I mean, it was quick and easy. It was great. So barring taking a number ticket and sitting there for an hour and a half waiting, the actual process is very easy. Number four, RV insurance is a lot cheaper than I expected. Now, right now, I just have comprehensive. I'm not living in it yet. I'm sure once I go full-time, it's going to be totally different. But we're right now with comprehensive, which basically covers anything except collision. You know, if it's like theft, flood, vandalism, anything like that, you're covered. But I think the cost for six months was like two... 79 or something like that. It really was not bad at all. Um, number five, it's not what you think at all. <laughs> now, what I'm referring to here is there are so many elements that go into making your rig a fully functional home. Now, in the movies, and I think that most people like naturally just think this about RVs anyway, you are under the impression that your RV is a home on wheels and it has the full functionality of your regular home at home at any given time. And that could not be farther from the truth. Like I said, there are so many elements that go into it. I mean, your water, anything that uses water, your sinks, your shower, your toilet, your septic system consists of three tanks, a fresh water, a gray water, and a black water. You've got to fill the fresh tank up. You've got to empty the other ones. You have to watch and monitor those levels. At home, you just use your water and go on about your day. Use the toilet and go on about your day. But here, you have to constantly monitor this stuff. In addition to the fact that a toilet in an RV is nothing like a toilet at home. At home, you go to the bathroom, you flush it, you walk away. An RV toilet, I mean, and there are several different kinds but like the one in mine, it has a little, you know, push pedal, a foot pedal. And uh, let's just say you have to hold it down for a second to let some water fill up in there. Then you use it and then you flush it. And then there's like a spray thing over here. You spray it out. And, and there's a lot of people who say, I don't even use toilet paper in there. I don't put the toilet paper down, down the toilet. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff, guys. I'm telling you. Bottom line, it's just not as easy as going in, go to the bathroom and you're done. Um, you've also got propane for your heat, for your stove, in some cases for your fridge. And it is questionable, I'm still trying to learn about that, um, whether it is a safety issue, like to leave that propane on at all times. I mean, I don't think you can. I mean, first of all, you don't want to just drain it out and have to refill it all the time. It's expensive. But I mean, like my fridge, it runs on both electric and propane. It can switch back and forth. But when I'm driving down the highway, can I keep my propane on? Or do I have to shut it off and let the fridge run on the 12-volt system? And that leads us into the electric, uh, which is the most complicated of all systems. Like I said, in the movies, they present it this way. And I think that anybody just naturally would think that this is the way that it works. That at any given time, you can use any lights you want, the microwave, watch TV, do anything you want that requires electricity. But that's not the case at all. Um, <laughs> when it comes to electricity, you've got like your battery that starts the engine. You've got a couple batteries for the house. And that's what will power like the lights and things like that. Um, then you have a generator. And then you possibly have some solar. I have like a small solar panel on mine and I'm still learning how all this stuff works but the bottom line is that you do not just have full power at all times there are some people who have uh, solar 
all across the top of their roof. I mean, they have like a fifteen twenty thousand dollar system going on. They have power at all times. But without that, I mean, you're like you're you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You know, it, it, it's really strange. And like I said, I'm still trying to learn it. But that's another thing that I learned that it's just not as easy as you can watch TV and use the microwave and cook and do all this stuff anytime you want to, even barreling down the highway. So it's just it's it's just crazy. <laughs> um, number six. I should have taken an RV inspector with me when I went to buy my RV. Now, all right, let me say that in a different way here. Maybe not necessarily that I should have, but I would highly recommend it. When I bought my RV, um, well, wait a minute. When I found my RV, I had just got in bed at night. It was like 2 a.m., and I did what everybody else does. You grab your phone, and you start looking at Facebook. Well, I looked at Marketplace on Facebook, and I had no plans to buy an RV at that time, but I saw one that was just listed, and for some reason, it just spoke to me. Um, I messaged the person right away, and amazingly, 2 a.m., they messaged me back right away. I said, I'll be over there tomorrow to check it out, and, uh, you know, I packed my bag and went over there to check it out, and I bought it. I had done research into what it would take to get an RV inspector. Because like I said, you know, I've been wanting to do this for eight years. And uh, and I didn't start looking at the, the RVs more seriously until just this past year. Um, but I did look into RV inspectors and I found a place where all you have to do is, you know, get a hold of them, they set it up, they come with you. It takes like two days or something like that. Um, or if it's kind of far away, I believe that they will go over there and look, check it out for you and then get back to you with a report. But they give you like a full report. I mean, pages upon pages of everything that they find. And they don't have a dog in the fight, you know. So they go in there without any kind of bias. And they're strictly going in there to inspect this RV, you know, top to bottom, front to back, and tell you everything they found about it. And to my understanding, give you some suggestions of what you should or shouldn't pay for that RV. But being that I found this thing right away and I was just going to run out there the next day and check it out, um, I thought, you know what, I've done a lot of research myself online for what to look for when I go to look for these things. Um, as far as like the most important components I don't know if components is the right word, but I'm talking about you're looking for whether the ceiling shows any evidence of water damage or leaking, the walls show any evidence of that, um, on the outside you're looking for like delamination and things like that. I won't get into all that now, but I did enough research where I felt comfortable with it. But after the fact, I would still say that um, I would highly recommend taking an RV inspector uh, with you whenever you go to look at one. So I'm gonna stop there with that one and I'm gonna use that to segue into number seven. Excitement clouds your vision. And what I mean by that is that when you go to buy an RV or a car or anything really, you are pumped up. Your adrenaline is running, you're so excited. You so want this to be the one, you so want everything to be perfect about it. And so it is very easy for your vision to be clouded and for you to uh, to convince yourself that this is wonderful and this is great and everything's you know perfect about it and there's no problems. I went to see this thing as level-headed as I possibly could be. I was cool, calm, collective. Um, I tried to be very smart about everything. I tried to look at everything that I knew to look at. And I think that I was very lucky in buying it without an inspector there. Um, because I have not found a whole lot of problems. But I can say this. I didn't even realize how pumped up I was and how much my vision was clouded um, at that time until like two months later. I mean, well, maybe just slowly over that two-month period, and I've only owned it for about three months. But it took me that long to really come down from it because you're so excited you know, I was so excited that I bought the RV, and this is something that's like been a dream for so long, and now it's come true, and so you're just you're just pumped up about it, and that's all you can think about: getting on the road, barreling down the highway, you know, living in this thing, waking up by the mountains, and uh, <laughs> so you're so pumped up about it that it is so easy to miss everything you should be seeing, and have that tunnel vision 
and only see what it is you want to see. So, like, now I'm starting to see more things like, you know, stains in the carpet that I totally missed before, tears in some of the seats that I missed before, things like that. Like on the couch, there's a big tear on this side and this side right by uh, each arm. I didn't even see those in the beginning. Totally missed them. And there's just, there was a lot of things. So, yes, those number six and seven definitely go hand in hand. Um, where I highly recommend having an RV inspector look at the rig with you or on his own, being patient for that process. Like I said, it's like anywhere from a two to five day process or something, but just being patient in that time because you are so excited that you may not even realize that you are missing a lot of things when you're looking at it on your own. So with that in mind, <laughs> number eight... I learned that you're either going to have to have a lot of time and money to burn or you're going to have to get mechanically inclined really quick. Now, I don't know a whole lot of people who uh, money is not an object for. And I don't know a lot of people who buy an RV so they can go full time on the road and then they want to sit at home while they wait for months and months and months on end for an RV shop to fix it up. The horror stories... <laughs> I mean, you'll just just start doing some research and you will see these horror stories in the RV community that are just unbelievable. And, and that's one thing that I experienced in my first month of owning my RV um, was my own little horror story there. Took my rig into General RV, um, sat there all day long, and I'm talking eight hours open to close. I was the first person there. I was the last person out the door. I paid over $1,000 in the end, and the only thing I got out of it was a little bit of sealant on uh, some of the seams on the top, and they even did a horrible job at that. It was ridiculous. I caught them in lies, telling me that they checked things they actually didn't, and uh, they didn't complete anything that I asked them to actually complete. It, it was crazy. I, I shouldn't even get into that right here, but that just lends hand to the whole thing where you either have to have a whole lot of money and time to burn or you're going to have to get knowledgeable and mechanically inclined really quick. Luckily, I am very mechanically inclined and I learn quick and I am learning everything that there is to know about my rig inside and out, top to bottom, front to back, and just about anything that goes wrong I'm going to be able to fix myself unless it's something like an engine or if I definitely wouldn't be comfortable at the side of the highway jacking up a big 35-foot motorhome to uh, to change a tire. <laughs> you know, so there are some things that obviously you're going to have to get done. But for the most part, I'm learning that um, most of the things in the RV can be handled on your own much cheaper. Like for me, I have the Winnebago. I can get a hold of Winnebago and order the parts. They are much cheaper. Um, I ordered two antennas that go on the roof. They charged me $10 a piece, and General RV was going to charge me $100 a piece. So that's just an example right there. Uh, number nine, it kind of goes hand in hand with that one as well. If you're going to do this full time, you're going to need a big emergency fund. You're going to have to have a big chunk of money sitting in the bank that you forget exists, that its sole purpose is there in case you need it. I mean... I just watched a video the other day, um, a guy that has a Winnebago, it's actually a couple that has a Winnebago, and uh, has the same engine that mine has, a, a Ford Triton V10, and uh, their engine went out, and it cost them $8,000, in addition to the cost of uh, hotel rooms and things like that. So, <laughs> I gotta be Johnny on the spot with ten grand if I'm doing this full time and my engine goes out. So all these people who say that the most important thing is to just buy a rig and get on the road and figure it all out later, I'm sorry, but that is crazy. That is completely careless. I mean, unless, like I said, you got money to burn, money is no object, then sure, hit the road, do whatever you want, man. But if you don't have money to burn, don't just go buy some crappy RV and hit the road and go full time because you're giving up your house, you're selling off and getting rid of everything you own in your entire life and living in this little RV. So if it goes to crap and you're on the road, what are you going to do? Huge emergency fund. The last thing I'm going to put on this list here, number 10, is 
I learned that I made the right choice in buying a used motorhome. I'm telling you guys, I mentioned the horror stories earlier, and a lot of the horror stories are with brand new motorhomes and RVs. Same thing, I guess. But <laughs> a lot of the horror stories are like, I, I bought a 2020 coach, and two weeks later, our ceiling is caving in due to water. And even though they bought like the extended warranties and everything like that, nobody will touch it. Nobody wants to pay for it. They, they ignore them and they basically say, well, we're not going to pay for it. And like the manufacturer puts it off on the retailer, the retailer puts it off on the manufacturer. And then uh, these people like, you know, they end up getting like attorneys involved. And it's just, it's a huge, huge mess. And most of that that I see is with brand new rigs. If you buy a used rig, at least my view on it is when I bought mine used, for much less money, my view was that I was going to be able to put a lot of money into it to make sure that it was roadworthy, to make sure that everything was functional and everything was fixed and working. And I still may have problems, but I accounted for all of that in the beginning by buying a cheaper RV, um, one that, you know, hopefully had all the bugs worked out and knowing that I was going to have to put some money into it. I could have gone out and dropped 40 grand on one and still ended up you know, with water damage and needing new tires and, I mean, just about anything. So, um, at least for me, I learned that I definitely made the right decision in buying used and uh, buying the rig that I settled on. There you go, guys. That is the first 10 things that I learned when I bought my RV. And, uh, and I'm going to keep these lists going as I learn more. And I mean, there's plenty of things. I could sit here for hours telling you about this stuff, guys. There's plenty of stuff that I've learned that I want to share with you, and I will make plenty more of these videos. Stay tuned, subscribe if you have not yet, and keep watching. And uh, you'll see me totally remodel this RV and get it cleaned up and hit the road and live out there. And this is just going to be awesome.